So, the government's efforts to send asylum seekers to Rwanda have been thwarted again, and the game of parliamentary ping-pong continues between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Will those planes ever take off for Rwanda? Should they? The PM says he has a lot of public support for the plan. Does that include the people of Middlesbrough, 260 miles away from Parliament, an area that's solid Labour but does have a Conservative regional mayor? We'll find out from our audience here, which, as always, is a broad reflection of the electoral picture across the country. They also want to talk about levelling up. Is anyone serious about it? And the government says mental health culture has gone too far. Are they right? Welcome to Question Time. As always, a wide range of views from the Conservatives is Party Deputy Chair for Women, Rachel McLean. She was Housing Minister until November when she left the government for the backbenches. Labour's Sarah Jones is a Shadow Business Minister. As a civil servant, she was part of the team delivering the 2012 London Olympics before she was elected MP for Croydon Central in 2017. Tim Farron speaks for the Liberal Democrats on the environment, food and rural affairs. He also led his party for three years. He resigned that position in 2017, torn, he said, between political leadership and living as a faithful Christian. Philippa Gregory has been writing historical novels for almost 40 years. Her most successful, best known, The Other Berlin Girl. Her most recent work is the play Richard, My Richard. And then there's her book and podcast Normal Women about ordinary women that history often forgets. And Rod Little writes a weekly column for The Sun and Sunday Times and is associate editor at The Spectator. He's a former editor of Radio 4 Today programme and is now in the Social Democratic Party. Welcome to our palace, welcome to our audience here in Middlesbrough. Great to see you all and of course welcome to you at home. You can follow the programme in a variety of ways on BBC Sounds, on the iPlayer and of course there's always a discussion going on on social media as well. Right, let's take our first question which is from Louise, Louise Edwards. Now that the Rwanda plan to curb illegal migration has been delayed yet again, does the government have a plan B if it doesn't eventually pass? Right, so the ping pong between mm. the House of Commons and the House of Lords continues. The House of Lords uh, rejected a number of uh, elements of the bill last night, and on it goes. Plan B, Rachel. Well, we don't need Plan B because we're still committed to Plan A, which is getting these flights off the ground. And if, if we really look at the context of what's happening here and why it's important, the British people do expect us to deal with this issue of illegal migration, where we see people coming across the Channel, dying in small boats, let's not forget, losing their lives in the Channel, uh, and so why have you got Conservative peers voting against it? And, they, and they've, been, they've been brought here by smuggling gangs. So, obviously, there will be debates in the House of Lords, but when you look at those but debates... But these are, these are si significant Conservative peers. Ken Clark, for example. Yeah, obviously, so it's it, been many years in government. I, I'm just going to explain where I think we are. So, when you're looking at these people who are talking in the House of Lords and are opposing this bill, which is a sensible plan to tackle an issue that affects countries all around the world, let's not forget. We're not the only country that is dealing with this demand to come to our shores. And other countries have a similar plan to deter arrivals, and that's how we will tackle it. So when you see people who are making speeches... Hang on, when you say other countries have a similar plan, uh, there are some countries that are looking at... Austra outsourcing, for, for lack of a better word, are... of, of sending uh, asylum seekers elsewhere. No-one's suggesting Rwanda. And I'm not sure they're spending these kinds of Other countries of have deterrent programmes and they've been shown to work. So we have to have a deterrent to deal with this. And so when you look at the people who are opposing our plans, it's not really about the safety of Rwanda, is it a safe country or not? Because, of course, it's a, it's a country that has international agreements with many other countries. We have treaty uh, arrangements with, with Rwanda as well. It's a country that's actually also working within the UN programme and taking refugees from Afghanistan. So there's no question in my mind and in the mind of the government that Rwanda can treat people fairly and with dignity and process those claims. So why claims. are they objecting? So, That's what you're getting to. So the point is we have to pass this bill regardless of those people who are objecting. The reason they're objecting is because they are making these statements about Rwanda but they are actually turning their back on those people who are dying in the channel. I think they're completely wrong to object to our plans. We need to pass this so, bill. And so you're including 
people like Ken Clark. Yes, I, I'm, okay. of course, we have an honourable disagreement with Ken Clark. I don't agree with his points, but the vast majority of the people who are objecting to this, regardless of Ken Clark, is unelected peers in the House of Lords. And it is also, let's not forget, it is the Labour Party who are voting against every single thing that we brought in to tackle this issue of illegal migration. Okay. Well, let's, let's come to the Labour Party then, Sarah. So the first thing to say is the Tories could bring this bill back on Monday if they wanted to, uh, and they could probably get royal assent for it by the end of the week because they have the majority uh, of uh, the, the biggest party in the Lords, they're the biggest party in the Commons. They have decided not to. It's not coming back on Monday because Rishi Sunak is worried that his MPs are rebelling against him and he wants to send them home for the Easter holidays early. So let's just say that because that's a, that, that's a fact. Um, the second thing to say is we've had, since 2018, 100,000 people have crossed the Channel. 100,000 people. You've got to do something about that. We have to stop the boats. That is absolutely right. But this is the third piece of legislation that is nothing more than a gimmick that we've seen from this government. We had the Nationality and Borders Bill from Priti Patel, remember her, that, that Rachel defended, hasn't been enacted. We've had the um, uh, Illegal Migration Act, which was Suella Braverman. Again, Rachel will have defended. We now have the Rwanda Bill. It's cost us £500 million. And do you know how much the government is spending this year on the National Crime Agency to tackle the <coughs> gangs? £25 million. What if we did that? What if we spent more on the, on the National Crime Agency to get those criminal gangs, find them at source, go upstream? It's too late once they get to the border. We've got to be more sophisticated. What if we got the uh, waiting list down? We've got, a, we've got thousands of people waiting. What if we actually dealt with them so we didn't waste all the money on hotels? And if you did deal with them... Finally, no, hang on. So if, you, when you, you, if you did deal with them and you, you managed to get the waiting list down and found people to, yeah. to process this asylum backlog, what would happen to those people? Well, well, that's why we said this week we need more resource going into a returns unit. The Tories used to return people who were turned down for asylum. But there are lots of people you They're know you now. cannot return. So, for example, the, the majority of people coming across China coming from Afghanistan, are you suggesting you're going to return those people to Yemen, they people to be. Libya? So you, you won't be returning people to those So the people, people who countries. are accepted for asylum is one thing. The people who aren't, which is a lot of people, is another thing. And that's why part of our the, I'm unit, just making the point that the majority of people unit, coming are from Afghanistan. Yep, and and you're not suggesting you're going to return people there? No, part of our returns team would be based in other countries to do deals in the the way that we have done before about how we manage, because this is a collective problem, uh, the other countries are dealing with the same issues, you have a deal where you work out uh, where people can go and how you can manage a reasonable, uh, fair system. The, the Tories have lost control of our borders. It's time for a reasonable, fair system, and that's what Labour okay. wants to see. But, but you accept, do you, that there will be a lot of people who come across the Channel who you will not be able to send back? because they will be countries that will not be safe to go back to, according to the British government, according to the UN? Of, of course, there will be people who come across who are completely legitimate asylum seekers, and we need to deal with that. Okay. Uh, of course we do, and that's why also what the Labour government would want to do is to be more influential as we were previously in the international development space because a lot of these problems, the source of them is war, famine uh, and people on the move. For lots of other reasons, we could be doing more in that space too. But the point is the border is not being controlled by anyone okay. apart from the criminal gangs at the moment and Labour has a plan to fix that. Right. Yeah, well, I, I largely agree with the criticisms that, that Sarah's made there, I have to say. I, I think Rwanda was always a bit of a gimmick was always problematic and difficult to put into effect. I think the major problem is that we're shipping these people out to a place which is not under British jurisdiction, and that it would be far better if we were able to find a place which was under British jurisdiction. Um, so I think that's an enormous problem, and a, and a bigger problem as well, uh, which is that, uh, yes, uh, it's been 100,000 people arriving here, uh, and there's been an awful lot of loss of life, and we need to stop that. And I do object to some of the charities who have been, in many ways, enabling some of those people to cross the channels, because I do think that they are complicit in the loss of life which we've seen. How, uh, how, how are they complicit? Well, well, because if you are continually trying to aid people to cross the channel, more people will die as a consequence. But which charities and that is, are trying to that, help people cross the channel? The, I mean, there, well, there are charities definitely that are providing food and, and shelter for people mm. who are uh, well, if in Calais. But... If you're providing sustenance and encouragement to people who are about to cross the channel, then you are complicit in, in 
getting them across the channel effectively. You are, you are putting yourself in a position of being an accomplice to those appalling criminal gangs. And I agree entirely with Sarah that we need to, we need to sort those criminal gangs out. I have to say, I mean, on the other issue, which is that appalling though these channel crossings are, uh, the Conservative Party has lost control of immigration completely. I mean, the, the, the legal immigration which we have to this country is at an entirely unsustain, unsustainable 650,000 in the last year. That, that is just not remotely sustainable in, in any sane world. Okay. And the, the final thing, just okay, to go back briefly, to Sarah, I very to briefly, to I've listened to Yvette Cooper talk about this. I really don't see what you're going to do about it, because nothing that Yvette says seems to seems to me to make any sort of impact upon what we could do with these refugees. It just seems to be uh, 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 talking for the sake of it and oppositionism for the sake of it, much though I agreed with your criticism of, of think, what the I government's done. I think it's about done. what you spend your money on. And do you spend it on gimmicks that were described by Joe Johnson today? Um, you know, the, br the brother of Boris Johnson as a performative gimmick. Do you spend your money on that or do you spend it on going after the criminal gangs? Or do you spend it on we are down going the after the criminal gangs. We, we are going after but the criminal not. gangs. But we're not. We're not. Well, 25 million pounds. We are, aren't we? Yeah, of course 500, we are. Of course 25 we are. million pounds. Let's no, spend we've, we've more the investment in on that. I mean, this is by sound, 25 million. This is just a soundbite, Sarah. Of course, we're doing it's that. It's a soundbite. 500 see, million, 25 you, you million. Can, you can well, see. you suggest you spend well, 500 million. I'm saying. Is, is, that, is, that, is that what you're saying? What we are saying in the Labour Party is our plan will be to scrap spend the more, but you're not committing to an amount of money. On, okay. on but, but Rachel, you would, you would admit the, that you've lost control no, of the No, no, no. The plan is. 650,000. No, Rod, I don't agree. The plan, is, the plan that we have is working. You can see that because small boat crossings are down on the last full year. That's not Can I finish, please? They're going up. On the last full year of data, yeah. compared to the whole year. And it was a record crossings, number yesterday, as Small you know. boat crossings are down by a third. They're going up. Year They're going on up. year. They're if you look at a full up. year of data, which you have to do with an issue of this seriousness... And, and legal also migration? Be because we have dealt with Albania, we okay. have dealt with Albanian migration, we've got that down by 92%. So we have got a plan, and it is working, okay. but we need this let's, Rwanda element. Let's have the audience, because there are a lot of hands up. Man here in the front, in the... In the White shirt, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the Conservative, uh, they know very clearly that the policy is not working. You're wasting the time and you're wasting the money. money yeah. And I think the only winner here is like the Rwandan government. I think you paid millions of pounds and you paid millions of pounds as well to French. And then I think you need to look at the uh, root causes, which is uh, the channel crossing from France. So I think uh, your plan A is not going to work. And you need it, that money, it needs to be spent here. You've got so many people here waiting for uh, their cases to be looked after. Yeah. And I think if you solve that problem, yeah. then I think the pro problem is, uh, it, it will be solved. But I don't think so, your policy is going to work uh, at all. Yeah. Woman here. I would just like to ask, where is your humanity? Because these people are desperate. Why would you cross in a small boat, risking your life if you weren't completely desperate? I think vilifying the charities looking to help these people is sick and twisted. Mm. We need to help these people. Yeah. We need to have humanity. But if, That's the con important. if the consequence is that the people die having been encouraged to cross the channel... You're not encouraging them to the cross the channel. Aren't doing no one's encouraging them, but they're helping them when they're here because they're human beings yeah. that deserve mm. empathy and respect. But okay. saying they they're human beings doesn't absolve us from trying to solve the problem. Solve and we the do problem need to and treat them the with problem. humanity as well. You this can do both him. things. All right. Man in the pink T-shirt there. Well, while I kind of agree with this young gentleman here, we, we do have people that are coming to this country that do need help, but there's a lot of them that are legally coming over, the drug dealers, the criminals from other countries. And to say to let them all in and, and help them humanely, you can't. You, you can't. You've, no, that's right. you've got to cut this off from the core. We're sending loads of money over to France, and it's doing nothing. They're letting them get on the boat and get across. They're actually not stopping anything. And it, it, it's sickening to me. This Rwanda plan, for me, is a brilliant idea by the mm. Conservative Party. Mm. And it's being stopped by, for me, idiots that are, are mm. just thinking of human rights and saying that this and that. But these people have no right to stay. They've come here illegally. Come here illegally? Fine. Brilliant. We'll have you all over here. Get jobs with you, work, pay your taxes, do everything else. A lot of these illegal immigrants that are coming over are criminals, the, the, the drug dealers, rapists, murderers. They're, they're getting away with a lot of it. I mean, I, I, just, I just point out that, for example, uh, a couple, two years ago, 
applicants from Yemen, <coughs> Libya and Syria, for example, 99% of them were granted exactly. asylum. Exactly. Just, just to, you know, provide a, a bit of context there. Yes, come in here. Yeah, it feels on the ground that at least the Conservative Party have a plan. Mm. I don't really hear much else about a plan for everyone else. And on the ground, more people coming in, people who live in the areas, you can't get a doctor's appointment. So it feels like more people are coming in. There's no services. There's not enough services for the people here. Well, a possible, a possible, a possible, a possible uh, Rod, approach. briefly, because I have got to let other people on the panel is talk as the well. Ascension, I would Let's send them to ascension. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. For, for the amount of money, the, the amount of money that the government has wasted on the Rwanda plant so far, so far, is equivalent to 5.7 million GP appointments. So that's how the government could be spending that money instead. I absolutely, though, agree here that we are having this conversation about it and playing and treating as political footballs some of the most desperate people in the world when the Conservative Party knows the reason they're moving the Rwanda plans because they think it might shift them a couple of decimal points in the opinion polls 75 you've meant 99% grant rate for some uh, countries but across the board about 75% of those people who seek asylum in this country when they are processed turn out to be genuine refugees I ask you to ask yourself what you would want to happen to you if this country was an unlivable and tolerable basket case and let's say Libya was and that is your answer. Now, we have got a problem, but let's remember, France takes three times more asylum seekers than we do. Germany, four times more than we do. 17 European countries take more asylum seekers per head than we do. So should we deter people coming here who are coming here illegally, people who uh, shouldn't come here? Yes, I'll tell you how you do it. You buy it by investing, again, another thing you could do with the, the money that is yet to be spent on the Rwanda plan, you could invest in 6,000 caseworkers. I'll tell you what would be a deterrent, because I said three quarters of those who apply for asylum are genuine refugees means a quarter of them aren't. If we actually had a government that was competent enough to deal with the backlog and then remove those people who are not asylum seekers, that would be a deterrent. So the Rwanda plan is a waste of time, a waste of your money that could be spent on the NHS or even on tackling the problem of excess numbers of asylum seekers waiting here in this country. A waste of money. They're playing politics with the lives of the most desperate people on the planet and it is a complete and total distraction. It won't work. It's wasting your money. What? 0.2% okay. of all the asylum seekers in the country will go to Rwanda, as if that is a deterrent. Either, either Rwanda is a safe place, in which case it will not be a deterrent, or is an unsafe place and no decent government would ever send anybody there. Well, we know Rwanda is a safe place because the Conservative government has declared it there as a are. safe place. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether it is or not, they have said it is. I'm reassured. Just as we now know that June is in spring <laughs> because they're going to send people to Rwanda by spring, which this year will include June. <laughs> this is not a sensible plan. <laughs> It's an incredibly reckless plan uh, because it's dealing with one of the most important issues that we are going to have to face, not just this year, but ten years from now. What do you think climate change is going to be doing to these very already poor country? There is a, f a constant demand for people to move from unsafe places to more safe places, and that's just the current political unrest and the danger of wars and the danger of famine. When we have climate change really biting in some of the sub-Saharan countries, we're going to see this and even worse. And I hope by then we have a government that has the humanity to put processing offices in the home countries mm. of these people so that they have a chance for legal entry. Because one of the reasons people are making this incredibly perilous journey and then getting on the sea and making another perilous journey yeah. is because there is no easy legal way to Indeed. come into this country. Yeah. And, and that's down to us. Definitely. And we should fix that before and we Philip do anything else. <laughs> when, when you hear two people in the audience there saying, look, we need a deterrent uh, because there aren't enough houses for people, you're saying you can't get doctor's appointments, what, that, and, and you're, you're blaming that in part. I mean... So, so, so do, do you feel there should be a deterrent or do you think we should say if you need to come here you should be free to do so? I, I, think that, I think I would really like us to sort out a proper immigration policy in which we figure out how many people we need and what we want them to do and then we can get them and then your doctor will probably be a legal immigrant. <laughs> and, you know, and then you'll have your doctor. Let's just hear from Louise again, because you've had your hand up for some time now and you asked this question. What, what do you make of what you've heard? 
And, and, and what's your response? I just think it's a little bit of a cop-out for Conservatives just to push the illegal migration issue to a different country and spend millions of pounds of our hard-earned money on paying for them to go somewhere else when we can actually build our own immigration laws and strengthen them and actually use them to help people when they come and of people who were, who were not meant to be here to remove them in the normal, normal way. And so when the government says it, we need a deterrent, I mean, that's the, the government's view, do you share that view in, in any way? Do you think there needs to be any kind of deterrent? I do think there needs to be some sort of deterrent because, of course, there's the, 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 the gangs and yeah. these people are coming across mm. and the ones, it's the human element. They're dying I, coming across. So I, something has to be done by the illegal gangs as well. So I do mm. know there has to be a deterrent, but what that is, I have no idea. I, I completely agree there needs to be a deterrent and, you know, more people came over across the channel yesterday than the government are planning to send back to Rwanda yeah. this year. So it's not a deterrent. What is, what would be a deterrent started, is people Sarah. at the moment, it's people started. at the moment, so when they come over... what would deterrent It's not started. People at the moment, when they, over, when they come over, when they come over on small boats, they are here for years because mm. there's such a backlog. So what would... So if you think so there needs to... Just that's quickly... What, that's what I'm explaining. So the criminal right. gangs Let's get to it. What would Labour's deterrent be? will be there for years. Cut that backlog right down with more caseworkers so we remove people who shouldn't be here and that gets rid of a deterrent. That is a deterrent. This is not a deterrent because there's All right, only you a handful explain of you think people it is. who are going to go what you think it is. OK, I'm going to move on because I want to get through a number of questions tonight that you have all asked. I do also want to say that tonight is the last programme before our Easter break. So we return on April the 18th in Buxton in Derbyshire and the week after that we're in Tottenham. So if you'd like to come to either of those shows, if you live in Buxton or Tottenham or around there, Go to the Question Time website, follow the instructions, and hopefully we'll see you on the programme. OK, our next question from Phoebe. Phoebe Teaser. Ah, it's you again. Right. With the public accounts inquiry finding that only 10% of the assigned levying and up funds has been spent across the country, does this government really have the ambition to level up the north? Right. So, lots of you asked about levelling up. And what you're referring to, Phoebe, is um, a report by the Pub Parliamentary Council Committee this week, early this week, that said that £10.5 billion has been allocated by the government for levelling up. There are three different funds, but broadly for levelling up mm. since 2021. Only 10% of it has actually been spent by local authorities, just 10%. Sarah. Well, it's shocking, isn't it, that stat? Um, and we know the way that the government has gone about levelling up, as they call it, is very often uh, local authorities have to spend thousands of pounds applying for funds. They then have to wait to see whether they get it. Very often they don't, uh, and all that time is wasted. It's not what you do uh, when you're really trying to grow the economy and to grow the number of jobs. So here in Teesside, we know there's a, there's a, 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 a plan in terms of the Teeswork projects, um, which has been questionable in terms of how public money has been spent, but we probably don't have time to go into that. Yeah. Well, hang on. When you say corrupt, I, I have to point out, because <laughs> uh, I thought this might come up, there, there was a report, it was commissioned by the government, found no evidence of corruption, uh, but they did find that there was insufficient transparency in providing value for money. Yeah, and no evidence that there was value for money, and we know that millions of pounds have been spent public money, uh, and uh, we know that that smells fishy, right? And, and so how do you build an area that has been, um, that has lost a lot of industry? What Labour would do is uh, first bring stability to the economy, uh, and that means respecting our fiscal institutions, having a treasury that works for growth, not to, not to hold back investment, bringing investment to our country. So we want to set up a, a national wealth fund, which is like a sovereign wealth fund. Lots of other countries have this, where the government invests alongside the private sector. So here, uh, carbon capture, hydrogen, uh, the opportunities for uh, renewable ports. You could invest in the ports. There's a whole raft of investment where the government can set some of the investment but bring in the private sector alongside it. And then, thirdly, we need to reform our planning system, our grid system, because there is a huge race, a global race for jobs of the future going on right now. We're behind. There is a way to bring industry into parts of the country where we want to see it. If the private sector works with government with an industrial strategy that this government doesn't support because they're ideologically against it. I think people have been let down for too long. It's, it's time for a proper plan that brings jobs, brings pride, brings opportunity back to our areas like Teesside because okay. people have been missing out for too long. And on that plan... Um... You've not mentioned an independent advisory council drawn from every part of the UK to monitor progress 
uh, to replace the current, current levelling up missions. That was mentioned last year by Lisa Nandy, who's in Shadow Levelling Up Secretary. Is that idea a bit the dust? No, no, I mean, there's a whole raft of policies. Lisa and Andy is in a whole different uh, role now. But I know I she is, but this, is, this was a Labour pledge last year. Is, yeah, is that and, still a pledge? And the, yes, and of course we need to make sure we're doing everything we can. So, the, the, you know, Matt Pennycock, our Shadow Housing Minister, will be looking at how we can make the planning system work here as in everywhere else to build the homes. OK, I, I just want to ask you about that policies. Independent Advisory Council, because I've not yeah. heard it mentioned since you mentioned okay. it. But that's still part of the plan, is it? Yes. <laughs> yes, OK. Yeah, I mean, look, the idea, I mean, first, I mean, I'm, I'm a person who's studied in the North East from the North West, a member of Parliament in the North West of England, so it gives me absolutely no pleasure, in fact, deep shame, really, to say that the only two regions of the United Kingdom, or the regions and nations of the United Kingdom, make a net contribution uh, financially to the economy, and that's London and the South East. So the need for us to make the North of England, every other part of the United Kingdom, punch at and hopefully eventually above its weight is massively important. I see the communities that I grew up along uh, side in desperate poverty and haven't seen much improvement in the last 30 or 40 years. So whether we call it levelling up or something else, it's an important and worthwhile objective. I think my critique, I mean, the fact, apart from the fact they haven't spent 90% of the money they allocated mm. to it, how, how have the government gone about this levelling up process? Well, they've pitted communities against each other, bidding for little bits of money in a completely unstrategic way. So a little bit of money for this town, a little bit of money for that town. But if you really want to make sure, for example, the the broader north of England and the towns and the cities and the communities of the north of England matter in and of themselves as opposed to how they relate to London and the South East, then you invest in real infrastructure between those towns, yes. which is why the loss of investment in railways has been so utterly, completely stupid. Yeah. Now, HS2, had uh, I, mean, I was in favour of it, although I did always think it was a kind of a southerner's idea of what's good for the north, if only you could get to London a bit quicker. <laughs> um, but, you know, but, yeah. but connecting east-west, HS3 was a thing that really would have mattered, how you invest... And it, it, it's, it's, there's no harm in borrowing to invest for infrastructure to build long-term growth across a region. That would have mattered. That would have made a difference. Sadly, the government has talked about levelling up. It hasn't done it because, frankly, it bears the hallmarks of a party that sits in London, the South East, doesn't understand the North, and then patronising it with things like this that don't work in the end anyway. <laughs> Man at the back. Hi, if there's been 90% of the fund that hasn't been used, surely the best way to level up would be to use some of that money to give to local councils in the north to help bridge the gap at the moment with so many of them essentially trading insolvent, surely to secure social services, adult care, yeah. child services, the things that actually levelling up could really make a difference with, surely using that money for that would make yeah, a massive give that man impact the job. to the community. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. <laughs> totally. Woman in a stripy jumper. My concern is that we have this conversation frequently, too many times. After this conversation we have in this room, how can we ensure that this is the last conversation and that <laughs> things actually happen from this? We have such a pride in this area. We want things to happen. But how can we ensure that this is the last time we talk about it? We really want things to happen in the North East. <laughs> Rachel, I mean, I can pretty much guarantee every time we come to the northwest, the northeast, there are going to be lots of people wanting to talk about levelling up, and many feeling that they're not really seeing the benefit of it. Well, I think levelling up is it is our central mission, and what I can say so about why so little so look, money look, actually been spent. Let's look at the history of this. The architects of New Labour, Tony Blair, was oh, the MP for it. Sedgefield just up the road. Peter Mandelson. Hartlepool. What did they do for this area? Absolutely years nothing. He's been in government. They lived Let's in London and they didn't that. do anything Gosh. for this area. Since we have come to office, elected on a manifesto for levelling up, with a number of MPs who live in these communities, represent these communities, have strong roots here. And since we've had Ben Houchen, the incredibly successful <laughs> mayor of this area, we have seen the first time ever, money directed to this area. Now, people have rightly said only a small amount has been spent, but can I just make it very clear that when you're talking about infrastructure projects, these are not things that you can deliver in five minutes. It takes a while to plan something like a huge regeneration project with a number of renewable energy projects which is driving jobs and growth, such as what we've got in Teesworks. And I think also it's quite amazing how people forget that we had a global pandemic for two years. We couldn't do a lot of the projects that needed to be done 
during that time. But what I would say is that what we've now got in this area, we've got the biggest free port that is bringing jobs, is bringing pride back to this area. And when I go out, as I have done as a minister, and spoken to new businesses that have invested in this area for the first time in decades because of our plans and the seed funding that the Conservative government has put into it after decades of absolutely nothing happening under Labour, I can tell you this is a start. There will be more to come, but you need to vote Conservative and return Ben Houchen and the other Conservative members of okay. Parliament because they so, are the only ones that are going to fight for you. The Labour are not going to bother. So when, so when the uh, Parliamentary Council Committee says it asked the uh, government to provide examples of projects. Uh, the Public Accounts Committee, forgive me, that it asked the government to provide examples of projects that had delivered change. The Department for Leveling Up could only provide examples that were, in their words, <coughs> relatively small scale compared to substantial and convincing examples we would have expected at this stage. Well, now, who, who's getting it wrong here? Them or the government? I don't agree with everything that this committee says. These, these committees are sometimes a little bit political. In my own area, the, Redditch... The majority I of the members are Conservative. I, I represent Redditch. We have had 16 and a half million The majority of members are Conservative. The majority of the PAC members uh, are members, that, that's, that's Conservative right. members but of it's, Parliament. It's this what, is not the Liberal elite. It's, it's, this one, is it's one committee with, with a view. Can I, just, <laughs> can I just make my point? It's Sorry, one Jerry. committee that has a view. There's lots of other committees that have looked at what we've done. In my own constituency, okay. wonderful Redditch, we've had 16 and a half million quid of government money for our town. The biggest investment since the town was actually built 40 years ago. Again, never happened under Labour. OK. Is that Redditch in the north? It's Redditch in Worcestershire, that's where I represent. Oh, Worcestershire. Okay. Philippa, well, come. we're in Teesside now, so, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about... So, so, so Philippa, what's your point? It's Let's north of London. What's your point? North of London. It's <laughs> million pounds. Well, what's your point? I just spent five minutes talking about the biggest free port in Europe that we, the Conservatives have levelled up across Teesside, across so, the what, north... OK, well, let's hear Philippa's, let's hear Philippa's view. The Does the government... Hang on, I'll get you right. Does the government really have the ambition to level up the north? That's the question, Philippa. The reason the government needs to level up the north is because they spent 14 years levelling it down. <laughs> As an author, I've been at three libraries in this region which have been closed and which have been opened by volunteers. And uh, I, I, indeed, I defended Darlington Library with total lack of success. And what, what I've seen in the North East is an absolute determined intention to take funds away from local governments, who are the ones who should be doing this sort of expenditure, and turn it into a pot controlled by central government, yeah. which can then be diverted out to various areas that the government chooses to favour. And Redditch is clearly one of them. I'm very, very glad that you're also... So is Teesside and so is Teesworks. But so is this area. spent the money, yeah. then? The money has already been spent. Ten quite a lot it of it. But as, as I've just explained, you're talking about long-term infrastructure I'm projects. talking about long-term destruction also talking of the North East, about, I'm also which talking has been about, done by your government. No, I think that's completely wrong. The as whole said, austerity years did nothing for this area and, and destroyed some of the infrastructure. Well, let, well, let's hear from some of the people in the area. From there in the pink scarf. I have to say that Ben Houchen, born locally, lives locally, has done an incredible mm. job for us in the North East here. We've yeah. got our airports yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Still working going on again, something that, of our pride for our generations before us. We've got a new hospital planned. I have to say to you, Sarah, we've got a Conservative mayor in Ben Houchen. If we end up with the Labour government, are you going to support Ben Houchen as strongly as what the Conservative Party Just have? Because lose. he's looking after us. He's a man <laughs> of our time. He's a man of our town. He's <laughs> looking after us. Are you going to support us? <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Just answer that, um, answer that specifically, because then so I want to move on. Specifically, what do we want in this area? We want regeneration. No, are you going to support Ben Houchen? Just specifically so that question. If mayor, we would support him in exactly the way as we would support any mayor. And actually, what we want to do is give more power to our regional mayors because mayors, uh, even if they're lots of businesses that I talk to say, actually, it's really easy to do business with a mayor because there's a whole team of people. They know what they're doing. There's a bit of strategy around it and we prefer it. So we want to devolve more power down. What I'm okay. saying is if there's a Labour government, you'll get far more investment because right. we've set up a pot of money that we are going to fund hydrogen, carbon capture, okay. steel. OK, so in fairness, I've, I've let you have an answer to this. Let me hear a bit more from the audience. Difference. Yes. With respect, it's easy for you to say that in the last 14 years you've levelled up Teesside. 
you haven't. You, the, the Conservatives haven't. With respect, Labour didn't do much better, but you, you haven't. It's like saying we've got Teesworks. Teesworks is still a lump on the floor, yeah. mm. and it's been shrouded in that much, let's just say, Which muddy obviously. waters for the yeah. sake of the <laughs> argument. Is anyone going to invest in it anymore? Mm. There's, there's, just, there's nothing here. Okay. None of you invest in anything. Can someone today say we are actually going to invest in you? Yes. Because you don't. You remember just when we needed the alcohol gel making for COVID, the North East was absolutely brilliant. We could just mm. produce it all day long. Mm. But now there's nothing here. There's just nothing here. Even the port's empty, as uh, not as busy as it should be. OK. Man there in the grey T-shirt. No, further back. Yes. All right. Let's be honest, uh, most politicians from Westminster think the North ends in Manchester. So, <laughs> as far as that's concerned, every now and again we'll kick up a bit of stink and we'll get a bit of lip service. But apart from that, I would love to know what goes through people's minds when they talk about levelling up. <laughs> because certainly, I've not seen a difference in my local area and I've not seen a difference in my living standards or that of of the people around me. So it just sounds a little bit like we're being promised a fortnight in Disney World and we'll be lucky if we yeah. end up with a wet weekend in Bogner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, ha I have to say, I'm slightly surprised you believed Boris Johnson when he said he was going to level up. I mean, it, it never seemed to be remotely likely. It seemed to be one of those things which Boris says and then forgets about the day after. Um, and the, the problem, I think, is that this area, which I know very well and live in, uh, is still suffering from the desolation which Margaret Thatcher yeah. reached, wreaked upon it it's in true. the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. So we have, we have those 13 years of government where the North was neglected, and the North East particularly, and now we've had another eight. Uh, under the Conservatives. And the, the problem is that what levelling up requires is two things. Imagination, which the Conservative Party doesn't have, and secondly, money, which it doesn't want to spend. And it really does need money. It needs big investment. Because you, you think of yourself as a businessman who is coming to Teesside to possibly invest in a, in a firm somewhere in, somewhere in the Teesside area and you get off the train at Darlow, and you get onto this creature of a train, which seems to have been built in Czechoslovakia in 1953, <laughs> and you trawl at nine miles an hour through a desolated wasteland, and you think, what the hell am I coming here for? <laughs> and, and it's not just that. It's also we've had a low-wage economy. That is vital. We have had a low-wage yeah. economy. We used to have great income coming into people's pockets, from the steel industry, yeah. from ICI. Those were, those were industries which actually provided people with a decent, way of, uh, decent uh, uh, standard of living, a decent way of life. And I know, because I've spoken to lots of the Redco steel workers who, who lost their jobs when Labour, Labour closed the steelworks. Yeah. Um, so let's not forget that. <laughs> And their problem was they were going from really well-paid jobs where they had mortgages and decent houses on the Lakes yeah. Estate and in Redka itself and so on. Uh, they went to jobs which were cold calling mm. uh, and working in warehouses, maybe if they were really lucky, driving a bus. And, you know, you cannot compensate for those low wages. Uh, then on the imaginative side of things, the thing about imagination and what we need for this country, and Tim was absolutely right when he talked about the railways, is we need a, a metropolitan light railway system which links Middlesbrough with all the rest of Teesside and links us with Newcastle as well. Annoying though the Geordies can be, I accept. <laughs> uh, so we... And that requires planning across loads of different departments, planning across loads of different areas, and we need that done to attract the sort of people who will bring into this area jobs which pay a decent wage, and without that, we'll be nowhere. Yeah. But don't believe Boris again, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take another question. From Angelus... <coughs> A million young people in the UK are waiting to access chronically underfunded mental health support. Should this be an urgent priority? 
So, uh, you said a million, I think it's a quarter it's a, of them. No, it's a million, Fiona. It's a million. A quarter of them will wait two years or longer for that support. Yeah. yeah. Well, <coughs> nearly a million were, are referred to child and adolescent mental health services. That's the latest figures uh, for 22 23. A quarter of them are still waiting for treatment. I think that's, that, those, are the, those are the facts. Should this be an urgent priority? Philippa? Yes, of course. I mean, if we don't look after our young people's mental health, then what future do they have and what future do we as a country have? What was really worrying to me about the uh, statement from the Minister for Work and Pensions today was a suggestion that there was some sort of weak-spirited malingering going on, which is, you know, he was saying that young people were self-diagnosing with uh, mental health issues. Of well, course, not just young people, people young generally. People. He, he specialised, his concentration was that there was this new sort of spirit of young people failing to get at... Feeling bluesy was a word. Well, he, he what he said was an increase. There an in, there's been an increase in conversations on mental health, which has led to people effectively self-diagnosing conditions. I'm grateful for today's much more open approach to mental health. He said, but there's a danger this has gone too far. The reason people are self-diagnosing is because they can't get an appointment to get to with them. <laughs> And worse than that, I think this is absolutely part of what we've seen happen before when Ian Duncan Smith retired from the Conservatives because they were trying to uh, limit benefits to people with disability. And what we've got now is, I think, the suggestion that people who are mentally unwell are, in fact, not really that mentally unwell and that they should be out at work. And clearly, I mean, he talks about people having seven minutes with the doctor and getting a sick note and that giving them a guaranteed pension for life. This is madness. <clears throat> he needs to go into a job centre and talk to the people who spend their lives trying to get people into work, trying to get reasonable adjustments for people who are unwell and trying to help people <coughs> who desperately want to work, who desperately want a healthy life, who desperately want a future and some way of earning money, but are literally too unwell at the moment to do so. And we said, when, when we went through COVID, we all said to each other in the spirit of post-COVID sympathy, there is going to be a lot of trouble with people who have spent so long in isolation and whose links with their community and their work have broken down. We're going to find it very hard with young people who haven't gone through the usual education process, with the kids who didn't do nursery, with the socialisation of the very, very young, with the apprentices who couldn't get in and have a mentor that they met every day and talked to. And we knew there would be this problem. Now there is this problem. And what, what we're saying is that it's not a problem at all. It's just another spring in June. Yeah. Rod? Mm. Uh, I think there probably is some overdiagnosis, if I'm honest. Uh, and I, I have some sympathy with what Mel Stride said, but I think, basically, we do have a problem in this country with mental health. Uh, it's not particularly something associated with, with poverty. It's something associated with anime and alienation. And we've become a far, far less communal country over I mean, the, the way last you put 50, it in, in a few years ago, Rod, was, was not quite that. You said, we live in a perpetual tizzy about our nation's mental health, <laughs> largely as a consequence, I suspect, of us all being too affluent and comfortable well, and not a, having enough you, other stuff yeah. to worry about. OK, if you want, want me to address that rather than the question, I'll do that. Well, no, it's, um, it's obviously... It's just you saying you think it's, it's, it's uh, the issues about anime and other matters. Well, I I'm do just think saying it's about anime. This was just another... Yeah, I do think it's said. about anime. Le well, do you know what country has the worst mental health in the world? Monaco, the richest country in the world. And if you go down the list, you will see that the, the, the countries with the worst mental health, i.e. the most referrals, the most therapists, the most psychiatrists, who, who are people who see psychiatrists per capita, Monaco, Netherlands, Norway, uh, Belgium, uh, we're in the list as well, but a bit further down. So it's, it's affluence. So the, the, there is a link between affluence and, and, uh, and, and the kind of uh, introspection which comes about as a consequence. And it's an introspection which I think comes, uh, comes about because we are a less communal nation than we've been before. We, many of our hubs, the local hubs where we all gather together, such as pubs, such as churches, are closed down. We don't meet each other anymore. We're far more transient. And so there has been a rise in a kind of alienation which leads to stress and mental health. It's very well documented all the way back to Emil Durkheim in the, in the late 19th century, that, that these are the sorts of things which give us, which give us a sense of goodwill and of self, uh, of self confidence, and I think we've lost that. 
Uh, and I think that's a real, real problem and something which Mel Stride didn't mention in his comments. Woman here. So I work as a mental health team manager and one of the issues that we see day after day actually is having enough staff to be able to drive those waiting times down. What are you doing to actually recruit and retain the staff that we've got at the moment and to support the burnt out nurses that are leaving the NHS in droves so that we can keep the NHS going and actually have any waiting list for anybody to access care at all? Okay. Well, sticking with mental health just for a minute, if you'll forgive me, because that was a question. Would you like to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two things here. Um, first of all, we are investing in mental health services. I think the figure is something like £2.3 billion across the whole system. Um, okay, so... I'm it's telling not you, enough I'm, you don't see it yourself, I'm just because you haven't got a microphone there. Obviously, I'm telling you what, what is being put in. You're telling you in. what you know, because it's your job. Yeah. But I mean, I'm there every day, but, you know... I think she probably knows better, well, is what I'm saying. Well, when we get to Labour's plan of how you're going to fund the mental health services, and I'm sure we'll hear from you, but I want to tell you that the government is taking this seriously. That's why it's putting in £2.3 billion of taxpayers' money. But I think that doesn't obscure from the fact that there's a central truth in what Mel Stride said, which I do agree with. So while we have to be very sensitive and compassionate about people who are struggling with mental health, we also have to be perfectly honest and recognise that there is some truth in what he said. Mental health is a very difficult thing to diagnose. Um, if you have a system um, which incentivises people um, to say that they have got a mental health condition, that, is, that puts a lot of pressure on the system to is really... Is that not your system? Uh, of course it's our system, but the system was set up with <laughs> compassion at, at the heart of it, right? right? But you're saying now you it's the wrong system. You have to have a system that... How do you have a system? You know, you have to be frank about how difficult this is. You know, th th these are things that people spend their lives doing, like the, the lady that, over there, and she's obviously caring for p patients uh, and people and, and dedicating her life to that. But when you have a system that doesn't distinguish between somebody who's just dealing with life as it is. Life is hard, life is tough, it's normal to feel sad, it is normal to feel depressed, it's normal to feel grief, it's normal not to feel happy all the time. And we can't pretend as a government that we can somehow take away the human condition that we are all familiar with. And by the way, I do know what I'm talking about. I actually have got two psychology degrees. I've studied mental health, I understand a lot of the difficulties with diagnosing it. But I think we do need to start having the conversation. That's what Mel Stryber is doing. He's being honest and grown up about this. And I think many people, if they look in the mirror, will agree with these points. OK, well, let's see. Let's hear from well some said. of the people here. Um, yes, towards the back. I can't see what you've got. I think you've got a dark blue sweater on. Yeah, that's it with a picture. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am one of the people who suffers with mental health issues. 11 years ago, I was in psychiatric hospital. When I came out, there was nothing there for me. I wasn't ill enough to go into supported living. I wasn't well enough to go back home and live with my mother. And I was just said, they said, well, good luck to you. Now, I'm running a business where I'm dealing with a lot of people who spend a lot of time online. I have gone out and I have found the money to make sure that everybody involved in my business has mental health support. Why can't the government do the same? Okay. And, and as, as, for, as for the comments um, by the Secretary of State in the Department for Work and, and Pensions, was saying there's, there's an element perhaps of overdiagnosis, as, as Rach was saying. Do you have any truck with that? No, it's, it's, there's no, you can't overdiagnose something <laughs> when people do know themselves best. Yeah, you're going to get chances, just like you get chances in Parliament who go and take the massive wages, vote in new wages for themselves. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and the man behind you in a blue shirt, yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, from the point of view of students, we receive lots of issues concerning mental health from students, which is greatly affecting their academics. And I think the government is not deliberate enough in ameliorating this condition for students which okay. fall within the age bracket of young people. So I want the government to look into this so that it can also enhance the educational performance of students. OK, so more help for students, you're saying. Yes, the woman there in the glass and strappy top. 
Um, I just want to go back to the comment made earlier, which I think is absolutely ridiculous, saying that poverty has nothing to do with mental health. I'm a medical student, we all are, and we see day in, day out people who have a really rubbish situation at the moment because they can't afford food for their kids to put on the table. They've not got a job because there isn't the jobs up here because the Tory government haven't invested money up here. It's ridiculous that you think poverty has nothing to do with mental health. It isn't. It isn't. If you look at the figures, it's nothing to do with it at all. I see I'm people sorry, day in, day out who struggle with I their mental health. It, 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 just, it just doesn't correlate. It, uh, you, you know, some of the poorest countries in the world have some of the highest levels of social solidity and, and social togetherness and the lowest mental health problems. It's... it's, it's it, sorry. It does correlate in England, though. If you see the <laughs> spike in mental health reports. It goes with the spike of Not poverty. everything is the fault of the Tories. They may be <laughs> awful, but not Kim. everything is Kim. their fault. Kim. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, look, I mean, so I don't have psychology degrees, um, but I absolutely do uh, know that over the time I've been in Parliament, you can see trends of issues that come and go, and by far, the biggest increase in terms of volume of casework that I deal with, and I've dealt with 150,000 pieces of casework in my time, has been the growth in young people struggling with very serious mental health conditions. Not the kind of things that are dismissed lightly by Mel Stride and others, but seriously debilitating conditions. And very often, it is their heartbroken, utterly terrified parents who come to see me. And that's the kind of thing I take home at night, and it, and it troubles me beyond belief. So there's two things here, isn't there? It was Angela, wasn't it, who asked a, a question earlier yes. on. Uh, and, and, and the question was about the waiting times. I spent half a day in one of my local GP surgeries uh, last week and talked to every part of the surgery, different um, uh, workers within it, the GPs, others as well, talking to one GP uh, who said to me that that practice has simply now stopped referring young people into CAMS, child and adolescent mm. mental health services. They've stopped doing it as a, as a practice because they realise that the people who need CAMS are too ill to wait as long as they'll have to to get treatment through it. <laughs> and, and, and so what are they doing? They're not, they're not not helping people. They are squirrelling bits of cash away so they can t take on a mental health worker themselves within the practice. They're working with a, a wonderful charity we helped to set up in Kendall called Wave Forward with Bernardo's. They're finding workarounds to help young people who are in desperate, desperate crisis. Now, we can all pontificate um, about what the source of all this is. And, and, but the reality, which is two things, one is, I think, we're a society that feels more free to talk about our mental health more than we did. That's a good thing. Don't slag people off for talking about something which is healthy. But I secondly... Can go too far, too. But, sec but secondly, far. it is blindingly obvious, for all sorts of reasons, we've plenty of people have touched upon it, that we are a society that breeds poor mental health. We are a generation that breeds poor mental health. Maybe it's something that's going on in the West as a whole, it that is. this is happening. I mean, and, and there's no doubt that social media has a part to play. I often say sort of slightly flippantly, when I was 15, if I made a prat of myself over a girl, nine people knew about it. And, but now, it's a, oh, you're exposed and you are humiliated. Andy Warhol said in the 60s, in the future, we'll all be famous for 15 minutes. No, we're all famous all the time. It's our job to cope with it. It's our jobs if you're an MP or in the public sphere, and we find it tough. But if you're not trained and you're a kid and your whole life is exposed to everybody's opinion, everybody's comment, no, no, no wonder okay. we are a generation that's under pressure, so, but we need to provide for those who are under the most pressure, which is why CAMS need supporting, and you deserve more colleagues. So, Sarah, you've been waiting patiently. Angela's question is... is is the young people who are waiting to access underfunded mental health support, should this be an urgent priority? I'm sure you'll say, yes, it should. How would you fund it? Well, what I'd say first is, it is I agree with Tim that it is a huge issue, and it's an issue in Croydon. People are waiting two years to access a CAMS appointment. And what Labour has said is that one of the solutions is to put more mental health support in schools directly so that you don't have to wait two years. You can get... So the workarounds that Tim talks about that are ha now happening between uh, charities and other agencies trying to find a way to help kids, actually, if you have mental health provision in schools, you can help kids straight away. Um, and, and there are other things, of course, we need to do, and, and it's absolutely right that social media uh, is difficult. I've got three teenage children. I don't let them use their phone, have them in their bedroom at night, um, because I know that many children do... And 
and that that would you ban smartphones huge. from, chil from children under sixteen? I wouldn't 16? ban smartphones. You no, should. but, but it's, what about it's mental health nurses? Worry. As the woman but is mental saying, health yeah. nurses, we need more. Uh, we need a cash injection into our NHS across the board, which Labour has said we would do. But can I just say on Melstride, <laughs> this is. A, a typical Tory tactic of blaming other yeah, people yeah, for yeah. their own failings. When I was younger, about when I was 19, I got pregnant, and that was the time that the Tories were blaming teenage mums for every problem in society. They did it then, this is 30 years ago. They're doing it now. We've had 14 years of low growth. A, a struggling economy. That's why we haven't got enough okay. money in our public services. We, we would just support just, mental health. Just hang on. Just let, no, let me just... So, sorry, what was your name? Mel. Mel. So Mel uh, works uh, in a mental health practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you want more mental health nurses. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to get asked this question time and time again as the election gets closer, uh, because obviously you're doing very well in the polls as well. How are you going to fund more mental health nurses? And when can Mel realistically, should you be elected in the yeah. autumn, when the election might happen, yeah. how soon realistically could Mel expect yeah. more colleagues? Yeah. Well, look, we know it's going to be really difficult because the state of the economy we're in after 14 years, right? So Labour is not promising that just like that overnight, every, that would be a lie and we can't do that. So but what, what, we, have said, to, to what we have said is there's going to be a cash injection into our public services, our schools and our health service funded uh, and and uh, we've, we've looked at the VAT on private schools, which is going to fund some of this. There's going to be uh, bonuses that are going to be cut on private equity. But you um, must have, and, and, and you've made those points, but, and, but just in terms of when Mel can realistically expect some kind of improvement in working conditions with more colleagues, do you have a notion? Are you talking like two years in, three years in, maybe not till the, till the second parliament? Should you get elected twice? It what should she expect? It needs to be we're quick. Not seeing, we're not seeing what people are leaving and we're not getting new people yeah, in. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. Some people, we're going to need to train more people, right? And that takes time too. And are there people that have left that we can persuade to come back? And what do we need to do to persuade them to come back? So we need to move as quickly as we can. There are thousands of kids. But notionally, no idea of when support. that might be. It will be quickly, but I'm not going to say within no, the no, first I wasn't. six months, within the first year. But we are going to put an injection of cash that the Tories haven't done into our health service and into right. our schools. Where's Angela? Where, where are you, Angela? What's your response? You've had your hand up I'm throughout a, this. I'm a therapist. I work in a school. So I know what I'm right. talking about. Rod, if you think this is nothing to do with poverty, can I suggest that you live in poverty for six months and I will give you a free psychotherapy session and we'll chat about your mental health? It's absolutely <laughs> everything. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it's not about poverty. Here's the thing. As our country has got more affluent, we have 40-fold more therapists and psychi psychiatrists than we had in the 50s, and I think it's something like eight times as many and as we had. And the population is much the, larger. The, sorry, just a, a, let me finish. And eight times as many as we had in the, in the 1990s into 2000. <laughs> you know, many, many more. It's been a huge growth industry. And my argument is simply this, that, yes, I, I think... I think the complaints about the, the waiting times and, and the, the short staffing are absolutely fine. And right, we should complain about them. And it's good that Labour might do something about it. But at some point, because this is something which is happening across the Western world, we have to try and look at what the cause is. Mm. And it's not the Tories. I mean, they don't help, obviously. But it's not the Tories. There is something else going on. And if you start addressing that, then you might begin to see a reduction in the problem itself. OK, I'm... And I suspect you're not going to agree, but I'm afraid we've registered your disapproval with your shaking of your head, but our hour is up. I'm going to have to end it there, so forgive me for the rest of you who've got your hands up. I know, it goes quick, doesn't it? There we are. Um, before I go, I just want to say thank you very much to James Barnes, who has supplied these pictures of Middlesbrough. Thank you very much for that. We are on our Easter break, but we are back in Buxton, April the 18th. Remember, if you want to come and be part of the audience, apply to the website. We would love to see you there. But for now from Middlesbrough, from our panel and from all of you. Thank you and see you after Easter. Bye-bye.